Sri Aurobindo is describing the nature of renunciation in the Integral Yoga and the conclusion we have come to is that the renunciation has to be inner and Sri Aurobindo describes the three knots of renunciation the three knots which bind us renouncing which we are completely free and these are attachment and craving of desire in the senses and the heart the self-will in the thought and action and egoism in the center of the consciousness and for all three he gave a detailed description of what that means and the direction in which one has to move to realize. In the last paragraph we read, he gives examples from the Mahabharata and the Ramayana. And we have seen that these examples convey so much because not only they represent turning points in human history, involving decisive action, decisions which have rippled out in their consequence for all humanity, but also that they represent in that decision an example of the true sense of renunciation, where we have to be free from craving and attachment but free from the attachment to inaction as well as from the egoistic impulse to action. Free from attachment to the forms of virtue as well as from attraction to sin. So this kind of a complete sense of freedom is something which we rarely come across in spiritual teaching. It is seen, emphasized in some of the most ancient texts such as the Isha Upanishad which is still very close to the Vedic experience and in fact forms a part of the Veda. And in the later period there has always been an acceptance of inaction in order to be free from desire, attachment and ego. Sri Aurobindo completes the true sense of renunciation by renouncing equally the attachment to inaction and attachment to forms of virtue. And in the portion we last read, he says, it is to be rid of I-ness and my-ness so as to live in the one self and act in the one self. To reject the egoism of refusing to work through the individual center of the universal being as well as the egoism of serving the individual mind and life and body to the exclusion of others. And in this he uses the word egoism in a sense which for most existing spiritual traditions 
would not be seen as egoism. He says, even to remain immersed in the universal being and refusing to work through the individual center of the human focus of consciousness is egoism just as much as serving only this individual mind life body in exclusion of others. And so the true freedom from egoism is something which is so different from the conventional idea that we have. We need to take time to allow this perspective to settle in our mind and in our heart and become a practical viewpoint, worldview for us in our daily life. He says further, to live in the self is not to dwell for oneself alone in the infinite, immersed and oblivious of all things in that ocean of impersonal self-delight. This idea of living always in this ocean of impersonal self-delight and the idea that that is to live in the self is something which has become so common that it is even associated with the true sense of Vedanta that you withdraw, immerse in that oneness and you are free. But he says that is not the true sense it is equally, he says, but it is to live as the self and in the self equal in this embodiment and all embodiments and beyond all embodiments. So there are three statuses in which one lives as the self and in the self. In the individual framework, through which the self acts, that is this human form, this human mind, life and body. The self acts through this as much as through each of the other individual forms, as much as in its transcendence beyond all embodiments. And therefore within us, this triple experience also has to be realized and that means we will have at the same time these three experiences that we act through this body, this particular embodiment of mind, life and matter, as well as parallelly we experience the same consciousness working through all embodiments and there is no special distinction that makes this embodiment superior to another except that there is a special focus here for the purpose of the play. And at the same time there will be a third status in which the consciousness sees all things beyond all embodiments from the perspective of a universal consciousness that knows all things or accepts all things equally as itself and the whole universe itself as its body. This suggests to us an idea which is quite popular in the current thinking that human beings would be then like cells in the larger universal being it suggests the same kind of organization of the hive or the anthill where each individual is working like a cell for the whole, submitting its separateness to the larger group identity, even allowing where necessary for its own loss of life in order that the group may survive and so on. But this is not at all what is intended in this description. In various casual discussions with people from different religious traditions, 
I have found this idea reappearing that when we bring, when we speak of a cosmic consciousness, they think of the human individuals like a hive in the cosmic consciousness. And it still sees individual egos subverting their individuality to the cosmos or a larger consciousness, turning humanity into a cluster of cells. Because this is an idea which emerges from the mechanical organization of the previous phase of what was called the modern age, characterized by a rational organization of humanity. It saw the worker as the model of the hive, workers serving the larger state, and the state as the entity which will bring peace, which will bring harmony, which will bring order to all humanity by organizing hierarchically. And so this idea somehow carries over into the spiritual conception. When they think of cosmic consciousness or oneness of humanity in a single human consciousness, there again, Earth as a whole becomes the being and human beings and animals and plants are like cells operating, subverting their individuality to the larger group unit. But this is a distortion, this is an aberration. It is not the spiritual truth. The description we have read of the self is fundamentally different because when an individual thus experiences living as the self and in the self, although in this embodiment, he experiences equally living in all and beyond all embodiments, but in all three statuses, he is entirely free as self. And therefore, when two selves meet, two individuals living in self, when they meet, there is never any sense of hierarchy. There is never any sense of subjugation of individual freedom in order to accommodate another. There is instead a spontaneous alignment of harmony because each knows the other as himself in a different focus and therefore adaptation is also spontaneous to arrange for the natural sharing or alignment of energies, interests and actions. Because each is still freely himself, there is a complete freedom. Because each experiences the other as himself in a different form, there is also an equality and a mutuality and there can be a continuous free play among all, quite different from the organization of the anthill where each has to serve a fixed place in the larger body of the being. Here, the analogy of the cell breaks down. It is not cells anymore. They are free individuals, entirely free in their individuality at each moment. And so, there is no equivalent of this in the current organization in nature. It is a new idea, a new concept. And if we do not understand it, it understand it in its right sense, it is easy to distort it to fit an existing mold of thought. You will recall an experience that the mother narrates when she was with a Lord Shiva and as a result of that contact, he left her with an experience in which she saw, she felt, she experienced in the physical consciousness 
all beings as if he says as if like cells in the larger cosmic consciousness and when she went to Sri Aurobindo he withdrew that experience and said it is premature mother does not explain why in the narration but the sense that I had reading this description was precisely this that if humanity were to catch this concept before becoming free in their consciousness of the self then it would be easy to slide into that distortion of the hive consciousness or the hive mentality and make that a strong formation in the universe for the evolution there are existing life forms species of beings just as on earth with the ants and the bees but on other planets more developed more evolved even human with a human mind where the nature of the relationship of the community is of the hive consciousness but this is not the intention for the further revolution for the earth on the earth the mother observes the psychic principle has been deliberately emphasized in a special way and it is a special focal point in the universe for this purpose allowing for the individuality to assert itself over the collective consciousness in between there is a transition of greater chaos perhaps because the ego gets exaggerated as an initial phase of development but if the spiritual truth asserts itself eventually and each individual recovers its uniqueness in its oneness in the self then it would be the true sense of the individ of the freedom that is intended to be realized on earth this approach is much more difficult in a species which has evolved in a group collective consciousness already for them to develop and highlight individuality and to be able to express a true sense of freedom would be much more difficult but on the other hand in their evolution there will be much less strife much less conflict because of the hive mentality and they would look upon earth as a domain of unnecessary conflict avoidable and not quite understanding why we are the way we are this is also true of beings who live in the subtler worlds in domains of the vital and mental worlds where there are also kingdoms there is a presiding spirit or being of individuality in a consciousness that includes all the denizens of that domain his will spontaneously influences all others though each may have a degree of freedom and so that kind of a typal formation already exists on all these subtle worlds it exists in many other evolutions on other planets what is being done on earth is something unique something special which as it appears has not so far been achieved in this way on such a scale anywhere in the universe and it is for this reason that the mother said earth has a special place in the universe so the sense of living in the self here is living as the self and in the self equal in this embodiment and all embodiments and beyond all embodiments this is the integral knowledge and this is an idea we have to consciously work upon because it is not something natural for us i shared last time 
my experience in meeting somebody who was, I told you I felt uh, in a different state and when I spoke to him he said he was trying to see the world from the perspective of the universe. This is a very useful exercise to deliberately disengage from identification with our narrow personality and try to see things constantly as if from above, as if from a free, all-inclusive vision of the universe. How would the universe see this? My current interaction with my friends. And you immediately have a sense of freedom from personal interests. Even if I am sitting with a group of friends, chatting, gossiping, or sharing stories, from the perspective of the universe, it's not a very important thing. There are perhaps more important things happening elsewhere. And so already my sense of self-obsession becomes less. And then what's useful in this interaction? Oh, through our chatting, through our sharing, we delight. And we share in delight perhaps. Maybe a very petty or narrow delight, but still, that's the only thing which is valuable or useful taking place here. And one begins then to highlight that which you feel meaningful, useful. When faced with a great problem, with a great conflict, a great struggle, again from that perspective you look at yourself, the conflict, the people involved, and then the larger picture of humanity, the earth, the galaxy, and the billions of galaxies. And suddenly that great problem fizzles out in the large span of space and time, it's just a tiny bubble in the form of the wave bursting to be replaced by other bubbles, the same substance changing to become new bubbles, the substance itself never vanishing. Only the bubbles form, grow, break, form, grow and break. And such is this current experience that I am passing through also even the sense of I is just one more bubble, as are all other individuals in the larger oneness of the self. And this problem has its own relative value in the mix of other movements. And one can look at it in a very different way, in which perhaps even one sees spontaneously the solution to the problem. And in this way, one can consciously cultivate this higher perspective of freer, higher and freer perspective of ourselves and our relationships with things in the world. But such exercises help to widen and free the mind and to liberate it from this exclusive identification with the narrow personality. As we dwell on the presence of the self around us, within us, beyond and above us, these things happen quite spontaneously. And yet this exercise of the mind is even a useful preparation to familiarize the mind to be able to experience the sense of the self free of forms. But as we move in this direction, we attain to the true sense of renunciation. And this, he says, this is the integral knowledge. Now Sri Aurobindo, from this perspective, looks back at the earlier understanding of renunciation involving self-denial and so on, and puts that in context of this goal towards which we grow. He says, it will be seen that the scope we give to the idea of renunciation is different from the meaning currently attached to it. Currently, its meaning is self-denial, inhibition of pleasure, rejection of the objects of pleasure. And 
he will now offer to us the justification for these three their place in the overall training and development which leads us to this true experience of renunciation in the integral knowledge and we will see a continuity which justifies even all of these emphasis given to self-denial and so on in the ascetic practices. So he explains, self-denial is a necessary discipline for the soul of man because his heart is ignorantly attached. Inhibition of pleasure is necessary because his sense is caught and clogged in the mud honey of sensuous satisfaction. Rejection of the objects of pleasure is imposed because the mind fixes on the object and will not leave it to go beyond it and within itself. If the mind of man were not thus ignorant, attached, bound even in its restless inconstancy, deluded by the forms of things, renunciation would not have been needed. The soul could have travelled on the path of delight from the lesser to the greater, from joy to diviner joy. At present, that is not practicable. So, the condition is this. If we were not thus ignorant, attached and bound, then we could have followed the path of delight without needing these self-denial, inhibition and rejection as our passage of training. But at present, because of the nature of the ignorance, attachment and binding, this kind of a journey from joy to greater joy, delight, lesser delight to greater delight is not practicable. But he says, at present that is not practicable. Meaning, it will become practicable once we are free from these attachments and bindings. Once the phase of the training of self-denial, inhibition and rejection is completed and we begin to live in the self in a true sense of inner renunciation, then this kind of an evolution is possible where we grow from joy to diviner joy, lesser delight to greater delight. So in between is this passage where this kind of a training is required. And I say in between because earlier also it was not needed. In our animal phase of evolution, self-denial was not required, inhibition of pleasure was not required, rejection of the objects of pleasure was not required. Because in the animal, although entangled, the possibility of disentanglement was not there. The animal is the child of nature's will and it is nature who leads the animal to its greater freedom by her push through its instinct. And if she chooses to play with attachment, then that is her choice and the animal is her plaything. One may even say evolving nature enjoys life of attachment, of entanglement, of binding in desire because that is one of the possibilities of the play. She uses those attachments, bindings and ignorance to build forms more and more diverse and sophisticated until at some point she says, all right, now I'm ready to go beyond. And as she emerges then into the possibility of self-aware mind, she prods in the mind's instinct, the sense of frustration that comes from being attached, from being bound and from being ignorant. And so in the human mind automatically through nature's instinct, we begin to restrain ourselves 
to inhibit, to reject, to deny, in small steps, in order to acquire a degree of freedom and self-mastery that we may enjoy less painfully. When we have come into sufficient self-knowledge to understand the larger journey of evolution and when we have had glimpses of higher kinds of delight and joy of the divine nature, then we see an urgency in the need for self-denial, inhibition and rejection and the monastic phase becomes almost inevitable. The ascetic passage of humanity is a useful training at that point in order to rapidly become free. But in the act of freeing ourselves, the instruments we have used to gain that freedom now bind us. So self-denial, inhibition of pleasure and rejection of objects of pleasure now attach to us and become our traps, though a greater, higher, more refined trap. Even, Sri Aurobindo will say later, they become obstacles and even hostile forces when we are called to advance beyond them. To be able to let go of that self-denial and rejection and inhibition, which are now such great ideals, is itself a problem. So, but this is the critical passage that we need to go beyond them into the true sense of renunciation and then we can participate freely in the divine delight and the divine play. So this period of denial, inhibition and rejection is a transition in between. It does not apply to all of humanity. It applies only to that part of humanity which sees the, which experiences the urgency and the necessity to become free and to rise beyond the subjection to animality which prevents me from being truly myself. So, he explains now the three requirements and you will see all these things come in threes <laughs> because they relate to three different parts of our being, the heart, the sense and the mind. First, Self-denial is a necessary discipline for the soul of man because his heart is ignorantly attached. So when we read the sentence, there is an obvious meaning that we have to it. Our heart is attached ignorantly. We don't really know. We don't really understand things for what they are. And therefore, the self-denial in the soul is needed. But if you where to read the same sentence in Sanskrit, the meaning would, there would be multiple levels of meaning. Sri Aurobindo, although writing in the English language, is still articulating from a mind, from a consciousness, which is multi-dimensional, multi-leveled. And so we have to look deeper into the sense of the words, into their etymology, into what they really are intended to represent. And one of these words, critical to understand, is ignorance. When he says, self-denial is a necessary discipline for the soul of man because his heart is ignorantly attached. So when we say ignorantly attached, it has several levels of meaning. The first level is this, which we have already understood as my attachment is there because I don't know better. And that's ignorance, lack of knowledge. But the deeper sense of ignorance is the sense of division, the sense of separateness. You will recall from our study of the Isha Upanishad, which speaks of Vidya and Avidya, both of which serve a purpose, are complementary aspects. Vidya, Sri Aurobindo translates as knowledge of unity and avidya as knowledge of division. In their extreme, knowledge of unity leads to oneness in the divine consciousness and therefore vidya, 
true sense of knowledge is the knowledge of the divine. In the extreme, the knowledge of division of consciousness leads to self-loss, leads to loss of knowledge, loss of consciousness, loss of capacity, and therefore leads to ignorance, and therefore the word ignorance is used to describe avidya. So in all translations of the Isha Upanishad, you will find vidya and avidya translated as knowledge and ignorance. But in the translation, this deeper, richer sense of the truth is lost because already our minds are used to very flat, single-dimensioned meanings. <clears throat> we are taught from childhood, this word means this. But if it were said in Sanskrit, the word means not just this, it means this whole direction and movement of an experience. And therefore it can be described on multiple levels in different facets or aspects. And so ignorance here seen in that sense suggests to us his heart is ignorantly attached, meaning his heart is attached in a state of separation, in a consciousness of division. Because I am divided and I am not this object, this object is other than I, therefore I feel in possessing it, the need to attach that it can become mine, that I may experience the permanence of belonging, of owning. And so this is the ignorant attachment of the heart. Object, maybe person, maybe experience, maybe situation, maybe comfort, maybe idea, maybe ideal, whatever form it is, the sense of separate separation of consciousness awakens the need to attach in order to recover unity. To claim to possess because secretly I know that I have to become one because I am one. So this is the deeper meaning of heart is ignorantly attached and therefore self-denial is a necessary discipline for the soul of man. There's a third perspective also one can see in this sentence and it would be obvious when we shift our point of reference. So far we're still looking at things from within our divided consciousness. But for the moment, step back from this, look at the big picture. Divided consciousness exists in these lower levels of division. There is above them the consciousness which is undivided, the consciousness of oneness, the sat chit ananda domains. Below in the lower hemisphere of the universe is mind, life, body in divided consciousness. Look at this now from the perspective of the higher united consciousness. From there, as whatever way the mind can conceive of it, look down towards this domain of the divided consciousness. I as soul belong to the consciousness of unity in the Satchidananda. That is our home. That is our origin. And therefore the Veda exclaims, O oh, ye children of immortality, listen, Srinvantu, and Amritasya Putra, because this is the domain which is our home. Of this we are children entering the domain of divided consciousness when we enter into the birth on earth in mind, life, body. And so, and this is now the big picture, the, for the soul of man and the soul in its origin being free, having entered this domain of entanglement of divided consciousness, his heart is ignorantly attached. Being attached in that divided consciousness to a few pieces, he cannot enjoy the true sense of freedom which is already his in his soul in the part of his consciousness of unity. In this part which has entered division, he has lost the sense of oneness and the freedom and the delight which belongs to him, which belongs to us, but lost because we chose in our division 
in our ignorance to entangle, to attach with a few pieces. Being anchored, the ship is unable to move. Although the current pushes it and it experiences the friction against the grain of the current, suffers, experiences the beating of the waves and the breakdown, but the breakdown only releases it from the false anchor so that it can move forward. And it re-anchors itself and again breaks and re-anchors again and again breaks. And it is thus that this part of the soul embedded in the divided consciousness struggles and journeys. But if for once it could deny itself to be free of that false attachment, recover the sense of a deeper oneness, then it would be able to enjoy the true freedom in the domain of divided appearance of forms. So now we reread the sentence and you see how it resonates on different levels. Self-denial is a necessary discipline for the soul of man because his heart is ignorantly attached. And in the heart we have this pulling, attachment to things, inability to let go because they mean something special to us. Next, in the senses, he says, inhibition of pleasure is necessary because his sense is caught and clogged in the mud honey of sensuous satisfactions. I breathe the perfume of the flower. There is the honey, but there is also the mud. And the two are entangled in each other. I am not able to separate the honey from the mud. I taste the honey of the flower. The taste of the honey is on my tongue, but the taste of the mud and the roughness and the grain which pokes my tongue is also there at the same time. I am not able to separate the honey from the mud. And yet, there is a satisfaction from the honey that is mixed in the mud and I am as if caught in this sense of satisfaction that I receive through the senses. Here again, the words used suggest deeper truths which the usage of mud and honey evokes precisely by its association with the Vedic symbols. The honey in the Veda is symbolic representing the sweetness of the divine delight in all things. The mud represents the dense material substance and form of substance which conceals, which distorts, which darkens clouds. And the two are mixed. So in the image of the Veda, at first not so much the mud, but the vine, the creeper which has emerged from the mud, the soma, has to be extracted from it, from life experience which emerges from the mud of inconscient matter. The divine delight has to be extracted. But in the act of extraction, there is always some impurity which also comes through. So the whole juice has to be filtered, purified. Even then, it has too much of the material character, of the material origins, and so it must be offered to the divine. And in that offering, it loses its materiality and acquires its divinity or awakens, reveals its divinity. And then it is drunk as the invigorating wine. It fills you with the light, but the delight brings light in the mind, brings strength in the nerves, and even transforms the physical experience. <clears throat> so that symbol is suggested here by this use of mud honey, clogged in the mud honey of sensuous satisfactions. We are even as we enjoy, confused by the form through which the enjoyment comes. Attaching ourselves to the form, 
we therefore suffer the consequences of the mixture of the mud. <coughs> and therefore it becomes necessary to disengage from that wrong enjoyment in which there is a mixture, a distortion of the delight. In the human experience, there is pleasure and there is pain. If you notice the relationship of the two, they are very close to each other. It is only a question of degree. Pleasure made too strong till it breaks down the form becomes pain. Pain refined until it becomes not harmful becomes pleasurable. There is a line which separates, a line which is defined by the capacity of the form to contain the experience. If my skin is very subtle, very thin, very weak, you may caress, but the caress would become painful. On the other hand, if the skin is very thick, insensitive, you may caress and I will feel nothing. Both are distortions of the true sense of delight. And so all of these distortions are coming because of the mixture of the mud. The senses, therefore, need to undergo a different way of approach for which first step inhibition of pleasure and the seeking after pleasure through the senses is necessary. Third, rejection of the objects of pleasure is imposed because the mind fixes on the object and will not leave it to go beyond it and within itself. So the object is for me the only source of that experience. It is the object which is giving me the experience and I think that if I lose the object, I will lose that delight or that experience, that pleasure. And it will not leave, the mind will not leave. It cannot accept that the same delight can come from other objects or that the delight itself is not limited to or bound to the object. And therefore there is an imposition of this denial of the objects. The ascetic therefore has all these objects of pleasure taken away from him just so that they may not catch up with him a wall is put around the monastery to prevent them from coming in and if at all visitors are permitted to enter the monastery well they must wear proper clothing which covers all the parts of their body sufficiently so that they may not be causes of temptation for the monastic in his cloister. At the same time, the pleasure itself is to be avoided. He still has to eat food, he has to do work. And so, in the more extreme forms, even the food is made as bland as possible. Deny onion and garlic, deny things which are too delicious. Of course, inevitably, human nature asserts itself. Tomorrow is the birthday of our founder or the founder of the religious head, whatever it is, a special day of God. Therefore, we must prepare something special which is more delicious because we remember him or her. And so there are these special occasions when the food becomes different, where the sensual enjoyment, the sensuous enjoyment is acceptable, but because it's that special occasion which we have to be happy for, that, that which made us withdraw from the world to live in the monastery. I remember meeting a monastic at the age of 18. I think she decided that she wanted to become a nun. And she felt that was the best way by which she could serve God and the world and humanity by praying for everybody. And when I met her, she was in her 60s perhaps, delightfully sweet lady, very young at heart and she was eating meat so I was asking them because she lives in Norway I asked whether it was normal, she said no in the monastery they have only vegetarian food but because once in a while they have to travel out 
they're allowed to eat meat because they don't get vegetarian food elsewhere. And then she said, the next time I'm going to have a chance to eat meat is going to be in March when I will be traveling somewhere. And I noted that in her mind already the date was set because she really enjoyed the meat, but the date was set when next she would get to enjoy it because she was traveling. So it was interesting that although one has chosen that denial for whatever reason, some part of the senses, some part of the mind which craves, it still calls for that. And maybe when all of us feel in the monastery the same way, we may decide that, well, we need an excuse for a special feast on a special occasion. <coughs> Precisely in order to prevent all that, the monastery life prevents any experience of pleasure. I've mentioned before that in some of the more extreme uh, ascetic traditions in India, they have to beg for the food, does not matter what is given, they have to eat as it is given, even if it is smelly or rotten, <clears throat> badly cooked, you just accept. To push it to the extreme so that you may not get attached to the pleasure of the food because out of love, respect or even pity, a householder may give you delicious food, you have to crush all the food given to you, make it one blurred, tasteless mass in order to eat, so that you may not distinguish something which is more tasty from the less tasty. So that's again useful training in order to disengage from the entanglement in this mud honey of sensuous satisfaction. And, and the attachment to the objects of pleasure, uh, which is imposed. So he says it is imposed on the mind. The word is also suggestive because it's the rule, the law, which you are compelled to follow. Of course, you choose willingly to accept that compulsion and that yoke. And the mind fixing on the object is taught to break free from the object by breaking the object, by blurring the distinctions. Finally, in all the monastery, the goal is still, you will get your delight, your happiness, your pleasure or whatever word you use to describe it, only from God. So either you serve God, you pray to God, you relate only to God, you are married to God, you are child of God, whatever form that the particular lineage or monastery may choose, the focus then is exclusively on the divine. Now you can see how useful such a experience can be. You are forced to have a kind of an exclusive focus on God, removing all the things precisely because they are distorting or rather our perception is distorted through those things. So here is the justification for self-denial, inhibition of pleasure and rejection of the objects of pleasure. If the mind of man were not thus ignorant, attached, bound, even in its restless inconsist inconsistency, deluded by the forms of things, renunciation would not have been needed. So he is describing four things if we could get free of those four things, then we would not need renunciation. Ignorance, remember that is division of consciousness, which leads to wrong perception. Attachment, where we are unable to let go of form or experience. Bound, where the, f the object itself is now compelling us, it pulls us. And fourth, deluded by the forms of things. This delusion of the forms is very specific to the material world where form has a persistence and fixity. In the subtler worlds, the forms being much more fluid, we can feel very quickly that it's not the form which is important, but the thing within the form, the joy, the vibration, the light, the force, the experience which is inside, which acts through the form, which radiates, that is more true, more real. 
you will perhaps remember these in dreams. In dream experience, very often, we meet somebody and there's a whole conversation that takes place. And you don't, when you wake up, you say, you're confused. Did he say it? No, but I knew it already. It's as if he said it, but it was not said. I don't remember words moving or words being said or speech or lips moving. And yet I knew it. Actually, at that level, as you meet, there is a rapid exchange of thought, emotion, because of the fluid nature of the consciousness. You know without words being spoken. A smile and everything has already been communicated and I've understood and received more intimately than I would have if words had been formed. See how much of human conflict is because of words. You said this and I've attached myself to the word and the meaning it gave to me. But at that level, what you intended to say is what I have directly experienced and I know it already. Immediately you recognize that the form is not important, the word is not important, it's the experience transmitted directly. In the material world, this does not happen. Because form is rigid, persisting, lasting, covering, when I look at your face, I don't know whether you're joking or you're serious for what you said. And after what you have said, I have to go through a whole process of interpretation whether you meant this word in this sense or that. So in the domain of forms, there is automatically this delusion. And if we could get free of that delusion and know things intimately for what they are, for what they communicate or they represent, things would be much easier. So these are four things. Ignorance, attachment, binding and delusion by the forms of things. If these things were not there, renunciation would not have been needed and the soul would have traveled on the path of delight from the lesser to the greater, from joy to diviner joy. Instead, instead of path, traveling on the path of delight, we are required now to travel on the path of struggle, of self-denial, inhibition, rejection, which is somewhat painful. But that path of delight, at present, that is not practicable. Yet, in the way Sri Aurobindo and the mother articulated the practice of the integral yoga, and in particular, a very specific line of development in the integral yoga, they named it the sunlit path where in the larger framework of the integral yoga which is complete in itself which accepts various starting points all possible starting points and gives a broad framework of a multifaceted development there is a narrower path which is based on an attunement and alignment with the psychic being and if, as soon as possible, as early as we can, we enter in relation with the psychic presence and we consciously cultivate that relationship and part by part put our mind, our heart and our senses in attunement to that, then increasingly we find that we are closer and closer to this which he has described as the path of delight where we grow from the lesser to greater delight from joy to diviner joy because this approach is innate to the psychic being which is not ignorant in the sense that the human being the human personality is ignorant which is not attached or bound or deluded by the appearance of forms. The psychic being is still in limitation of its own divine potential and therefore can experience incapacity, can even suffer but in a different way than the human suffering which is a suffering from emerging from ignorance, attachment and binding or delusion. 
the psychic being suffers when it the surface nature prevents it from expressing its true relationship with the divine the psychic being experience experiences incapacity because it cannot fully exercise its true freedom its true divinity it has its own sense of connection which we don't use the word attachment in that sense but it is attached only to the divine it is not yet the experience of self and living in the self and yet it is the closest thing that we can have within us of that experience most of all it is never deluded by the forms of things it senses it sees through even if the seeing is not complete as would happen from the development of the intuition it senses something is wrong something is distorted and this is the reason why it needs the full development of the mind opening to intuition the heart opening to the divine power force and energy and even the senses becoming refined in order to be expressed in order to be able to express truly what it sees and knows so it needs these three instruments to be perfected for its divine potential to be expressed and developed more directly but still the fact that there is already this influence brings us as close as possible to this possibility of traveling on the path of delight from the lesser to the greater from joy to divine joy and it is this which the mother has described as the sunlit path Sri Aurobindo in one of the letters states in so many words that we have had to go through all the difficulties and all the problems in order to be able to forge this path and he says to the disciple do not make the mistake of having to go through all of them here we have carved the way if you have if you only accept to follow it you can save yourself so many difficulties but at present the full path of delight is not practicable and therefore we have to pass through this training what is the training which we have to pass through and this he describes we will actually use this self denial inhibition and rejection as a passage as a part of the training it must give up from within everything to which it is attached in order that it may gain that which they are in their reality so the soul has to give up from within all to which it is attached in order that it may gain that which they are in their reality in the act of giving up the attachment in the act of giving up the thing to which you are attached you have become reasonably free that you can gain the thing which it actually is behind the appearance to which you were attached so he says the external renunciation is not the essential but even that is necessary for a time indispensable in many things and sometimes useful in all we may say, even say that a complete external renunciation is a stage through which the soul must pass at some period of its progress the always it should be without those self willed violences and fierce self torturings which are an offense to the divine seated within us so here is the framework of practice given to us in relation to the external renunciation first he says it is not essential but it is necessary for a time in certain respects it is indispensable and sometimes it is useful to renounce all things and then he says a complete external external renunciation is a stage through which the soul must pass at some period of its progress so now look at the big picture of the journey across lives and the soul journeying 
through so many levels of consciousness, through so many forms, through so many experiences, through so many cultures, languages, mindsets, enriching itself through all these. And there comes a time in that journey where the soul now prepares for a great leap. A great leap where it is going to disengage itself from the entanglement with nature, habits, and make a leap to grasp, to catch the Divine. And the leap itself may take place across several lives. The preparation for which may be over several lives. The act of the final result of that freedom and the attachment to the Divine may take place even in a single life, but the transition, the process of disengaging and reaching out may take place across several lives. Now in this big picture, a complete external renunciation is a stage through which the soul must pass at some period of its progress. Now consider that that complete external renunciation may have taken place in a single lifetime or even across several lives in preparation for this. And so when you look back now, at your own journey, you can see why that passage of asceticism, self-denial, inhibition, rejection was important. In the human development, in the last, let's say, 2000 years particularly, and it happened everywhere on earth. If you look at the whole species in its effort to rise, you can see this need for a simultaneous effort across all cultures, across all civilizations, across the earth. And you can see why that was so important. You can also see that the benefit that it gave still remains with you in some form, in some part, maybe concealed, you're not conscious of it. And therefore, in this life, a brief period of recovering that benefit of the work done may be easily attained by a brief period of complete external renunciation. And even if we went through that already and learned from it, we may need to repeat briefly, however short a duration. Somebody like many of the early sadhaks in the ashram actually passed through that phase before they came to Sri Aurobindo and the mother. I recall in one particular case, Pavitrada, Frenchman, scientist who wandered all over the world seeking a spiritual master, spent many years in intense ascetic training in certain Buddhist monasteries. I believe it was Mongolia, or I'm not sure. But after he came here, it was a radical shift. He was required to take responsibilities, take up work, develop facilities and so on, in a very different way, in a very different context. But the training he had stayed with him. The same you will see with Kapali Shastriya. In his earlier period of training, he was living the life of an ascetic, having been through intense periods of tapasya for months at a time, sometimes in the forest, just to be away from people, sometimes in some retreat spaces among friendly families, Afterwards, with Ramana Maharshi, for many years, when he came to Sri Aurobindo, it was a very different mold, a very different form of the life externally. But the inner, inner renunciation had already been established. And therefore, the external life could be taken up without any particular attachment to status, to work, or to form of work even. In 
Another case which is quite unusual, Acharya Abhaydev had already attained to a very high degree of development in his spiritual life. And when he came to Sri Aurobindo, Sri Aurobindo said, if you are to follow this path, first he said you have already attained a high degree of attainment, but if you have to follow this path, you will have to start all over again from a different starting point. The difference being the focus on the psychic being first. In uh, that unusual case, Acharya Bhadev accepted that. He had already gone along the path of, in the direction of self-realization, but without this center. It would have led to something very important, but an experience in which the world would have been seen as unreal. But in restarting from the psychic being, there was com constantly this acceptance of the world. And so there are examples like this. There were others who, having come here, had to go through a radical excision of their desires or attachments and so on. There was one example which comes to mind, Nolini Kanta Gupta, who came initially as one of Sri Aurobindo's colleagues in the freedom struggle with no obvious spiritual inclination as all of those young boys had in the beginning. They had a very different life. They were more interested in playing football and uh, going to matches and doing their things. But still under pressure of Sri Aurobindo, they had spiritual experiences. But during the 20s, even after, after the ashram was established, he would go once a year to his family his wife was still there in Bengal. He would go to his family, spend a few months, come back, and of course each time he would have fathered another child. So he had seven children in all. And he was working in Sri Aurobindo's room, dusting Sri Aurobindo's books. And suddenly the thought came to him, enough of this now, I must put a stop to this. Sri Aurobindo, who was seated behind, said immediately, finally. <laughs> Just the thought in his mind, and Sri Aurobindo said, finally. <laughs> and obviously it was not just words, it was a force that went. There was a sustained pressure, there was a breakthrough, and the breakthrough is what Sri Aurobindo observed. But with the words, finally, there was a force which was sent, a help given, and his attendant, Animadi, described to me how Nolinida went back to his room that evening and he sat through the whole night in intense concentration intro, in a process of introspection to pull out from within the roots of desire and she quoted from the from Savitri where Sri Aurobindo describes Ashwapati going through a process like this, tore out desire from its bleeding roots. A very painful experience when one goes through it, but which is extremely liberating because after that one is no more the same and the nature of desire itself is no more a compulsion. One may still experience desire but they do not cling. They are like the plants which grow, creepers which grow on the wall. You will see the roots they catch the stone, but if you pull the plant a little bit, they just slip out and they fall. If one is not careful after that, desire tends to regrow in this way. But having once been torn out in this way, they do not have any hooks deep into our nature. And a slight push, a slight nudge, a small incident awakens us and we say, oh, 
again it got in and you throw it out. But that intense effort which he did in a single night of concentration, intense concentration, he tore it up and threw it and offered it to the mother. And then he said, and she said to me, after that, he had severe diarrhea, loose motions, which lasted one full year. And it was the side effect in the physical consciousness of this very uh, intense exercise of pulling out from the roots. That's why I said it's an experience which can be extremely painful because it involves pulling out through so many layers even in the physical consciousness where the roots are set. But once through that pain, the freedom is worth it and even if in the body consciousness there are reactions, well, one deals with them. In most cases though, the process is more gradual and there is as if a loosening of the roots a gradual disentanglement and at some point sometimes a swift action of throwing out not too painful or a gradual release and one finds over a few years that somehow now the desires don't cling so easily there are a few which remain they are more like small deep set roots like weeds you pull them out they break and some tiny piece remains which tends to regrow but it's no more a practical problem anymore a similar exercise can also take place in the elimination of the ego. It may be one swift cutting off, but for which there is a long preparation beforehand. Or the preparation unfolds in a gradual loosening up and the ego is there, but it is no more an issue, it becomes less and less important and it kind of melts away and fades away gradually. But these are all possibilities which uh, are in the domain of the human variety of human experience. So here the description is of complete external renunciation as a stage through which the soul must pass at some period of its progress. Now the bulk of the attainment of that may have already been had in a previous life, the result of which comes into this life. And we see this sometimes in children, even in their young age, they have a spontaneous sense of detachment. They're involved in things, but they seem almost unaffected somehow by the things which are around them. They have no personal attachments. I remember a boy in my class, he had a kit of... Uh, construction kit and he was very good at it, he really loved it and because we were using it in the class with others. When he left my class, he brought that whole kit and gave it away to the class for the future children who would use it. I saw in that gesture something very special. When he gave it, there was no thread connecting him to that object. There was no sense of longing, no sense of loss, no sense of having given something or a sacrifice made or a special gift made. You see, when, when there is an attachment and you are generous, you give it, but you feel how important the gift is. He just gave it as if he never had it and he was completely free. And recently I met his parents, this is now almost 15 or 20 years later, he was at that time 10, he is now in his mid-twenties. And so when I met his parents, I said, I still remember him, although I had mixed up his name, I said, I still remember him for this thing. When he made that gesture, he was free. And I said, this is something which he had obviously achieved in a previous life. I've had no personal f uh, contact with him after that one event. And his parents in interestingly said, yes, he still has this today as an adult. He has no personal attachment to any of his possessions. He may have the most expensive watch on his hand and if he finds somebody likes it, he will just give it away like that and without feeling anything. That is unusual because sometimes, although the work is done in a previous life, when we re-enter a new form, new body and the certain environment is particularly unhelpful, we may get sucked into the habit of attachment 
although the inner being is free, the outer nature can become something which is concealing rather than revealing of the inner freedom. And then it happens, sometimes late in life, suddenly the inner being asserts itself, breaks the mold, and you have this free, detached person who is able to just move on. And you wonder what happened, what was the transition point. I think it was the case in the example of the life of Prabhupada, the founder of ISKCON. And uh, he was living a householder's life. I'm sure there must have been signs of a detachment already. And one day he just left everything, walked out and went on this mission to found the uh, institution which became a worldwide massive institution. And one cannot build such institutions unless there is a great power working through supporting the effort. Obviously, the instrument was ready. He went through a certain phase of experiences and moved on. We see this in, an exam in some examples in, among sadhaks in the ashram. They had a strong spiritual inclination, a strong aspiration, wanted to come to the ashram but we see in the correspondence, Sri Aurobindo writing something like, not yet ready. And after a few years, Sri Aurobindo says, yes, you are ready. They were in their normal life routine, sometimes with family, sometimes married, sometimes not. But there was obviously something which they were passing through, which, where they were exhausting some of their attachments. And when Sri Aurobindo felt they were ready for a concentrated, exclusive focus, then he would say yes, and they were allowed to come. And it was understood at that time, because the framework was, of the ashram was much more strict, that they cut off all connections with family when they came here. Of course, now the circumstances are different, this is no more the case, but at that time this was a strict rule. Even correspondence was to be avoided, and even exchange of gifts were not permitted because there was an exclusive focus on the Divine. So we see that there can be a preparation in a previous life and yet a quick passage of passing through perhaps life experiences of attachment and then a cutting off, a freeing up and a giving up completely may take place. A complete external renunciation. But after that you are given back everything the whole life is given to you and all the responsibilities and they are no more yours. It is the Divine who gives you those things. There's an aphorism from Sri Aurobindo, I wish I had the book with me now, where he goes something like this. He says, my lover, the Divine, took away from me everything and then he gave it back. And who am I to complain <laughs> if he gives it back? Except the difference is it's no more it's no more yours. It is his and he gives it to you to be looked after as his property. I had an interesting question, query coming from somebody who is in family life with his business, fully engaged and yet the inner being always is aspiring, living for the divine. And he asked this question, how to live the life of an ashramite, although I'm in this city far away. And I said to him, consider everything given to you in your life as belonging to the mother. The business belongs to the mother. She has given it to you to look after for her. Your wife and your children belong to you, belong to the mother given to you to look after as wife and child but they are hers and you must care for them as her property as her children as her belonging to her not yours and every relationship and every object that comes to you is hers given to you for her use in life what her right use is you have to find your way if you make an error you can correct for it. If you don't know, you can ask her. But at each moment you treat everything given as hers. If you were to really push this all the way, you would say, even your mind given to you 
is hers, given to you for her work. Even the life energy that fills you is hers, given to you for her work. Even this body is hers, given to you for her work. And then you ask yourself, well, what am I supposed to do with this mind-life body? They are not mine, they are hers. And you put them to good use in her service for, for development of her work on earth. And in this way, you are a true ascetic, in this true sense of the word. So in that case, of course, the, it was not ascetic, you are a sadhak of the ashram. But that's really the framework of life given to us when we came to the ashram. In those days, when you came, everything that you possessed was given to Sri Aurobindo and the mother. Nothing left. When uh, that is done, then the mother gives you a place to stay, clothes to wear, objects to use, a work to do. They are no more yours. They are hers. But you look after them as you would in her service. But the same thing can happen wherever you are in the world, in whatever circumstance, that you make this inner decisive giving up. So this complete external renunciation is a stage through which the soul must pass at some period of its progress. But having done that, we can have a complete internal renunciation because now the experience is there, it's familiar to us. So he says the external renunciation is not the essential, but even that it is necessary for a time, indispensable in many things and sometimes useful in all things. And this is a, a passage that we pass through. In many things it is indispensable, especially in all sense of possession, ownership, where we have strong attachments. In all experiences where we have strong desires. In all positions where we may have strong sense of ego assertion. And so those things are often denied. In the ashram, the starting point, the mother made the rule, no smoking, drinking, sex or politics. And the explanation the mother gave was, if I put any rule, the instinct in human nature is precisely to oppose the rule. And we see this, when you see a sign that says, wet paint, you'll reach out curiously, you need to reach out and touch to see if it's actually wet. Why? It's the nature of human instinct to push against any imposition in order to recover our true freedom. But that's the truth behind. On the surface, it's a distortion. So she said, I don't put rules deliberately for this reason. I want each one to follow as far as possible the inner psychic sensitivity. But these four minimum rules, of course, are required without which there would not be an ashram. So that was the starting point. In practice though, once she admitted the students and their parents, even these rules became somewhat diluted and she took it as a challenge to that having accepted people who were not yet ready for an exclusive spiritual life, whether she could build that framework of gradations through which they could move towards that focus. And so we had people who were smoking, who were having alcohol, even now there are people like that. Satprem used to go through intense bouts of depression and suicidal tendencies. And so once when he was in a very difficult state, the mother simply told him, why do you bother with all this? Just go into your garden, lie down on the grass. In one hand you hold a glass of wine, hold a glass of wine, and the other you hold a cigar and just enjoy life. <laughs> a very important advice <laughs> for all of us. The thing is, in the effort, sometimes when we experience these very strong entanglements, on all other parts we may be free, but in certain parts we have very strong entanglements, one goes through a process of indulgence sometimes, in order to exhaust and then to move on. 
And you'll find this in some letters of Sri Aurobindo where he says, there are two ways in which one overcomes some of these attachments. One is to cut them off. The other is to pass through them until we see their, uh, how useless they are to fulfill, to satisfy that deeper part of us. And then in a swift movement we can cut off and move on. So here you are seeing these gradations, necessary for a time, an external renunciation, indispensable in many things and sometimes useful in all things, and a complete external renunciation as a stage we have to pass through at some period of the soul's progress. But in all ways, in all these renunciations externally, always it should be without those self-willed violences and fears self-torturings which are an offense to the divine seated within us. Often we find people who are in a more ascetic phase uh, in their uh, life. In order to overcome a strong desire, they will beat down the part which experiences the desire. Of the kind of a violence, the result is a numbing of that part the numbing is not a freedom. This is of course the practical result of many of the ascetic practices. People who live bare-bodied, exposed to sun, rain and wind, very quickly develop a thick skin and an insensitivity. The body itself you can see has become coarse. Does it help for the divine manifestation, for the divine expression, for the perception of the divine in things? And these are distortions, perversions even, when it becomes a symbol of pleasure to demonstrate your coarseness or insensitivity. So, these fears, self-torturings and self-willed violences, they can even be on oneself. They are not always, uh, they are never good, but they are not even helpful in truly becoming free. But sometimes they are very, there are difficult passages when one does not know what to do. There was an example given from the life of Master Sheng Yen in the Chan Buddhist tradition. He is the one who revived that tradition. Interestingly, it was one of the few Buddhist traditions where the effort is not a complete withdrawal into the Absolute but a recovery of the domain of relativity from the standpoint of the Absolute and even an acceptance of life. Not yet the explicit idea of divinization, but there is the idea of expressing something of divine nature in life. In his training, because it was a monastic training, there were periods when he was struggling with his body's desires and sometimes they were so intense that he would run in the forest screaming in agony. It lasted a couple of years. These are sometimes so difficult as to drive a person mad. But he survived, overcame and was free. In such circumstances, one wonders even whether it is worthwhile to make the effort. But if we take a passage which is not so extremely ascetic, and we allow for a gradual development, one need not go through such extreme experiences or the violences or self-torturings which sometimes are means for suppression rather than transformation. Who suffers when you compel it on you? In the Bhagavad Gita, Sri Krishna says, it is I in the hearts of men who suffer when you torture the body. So, that being the reference, we don't want to put the divine within us through suffering. And this is what he is saying. It is an offense to the divine seated within us. So, in the approach of the integral yoga, there is never self-torture. There is never self-willed violence. Even a violence to suppress and to crush down a part in us which opposes or resists is not accepted. Rather, we deal with that part gently, 
tenderly, sometimes forcefully or decisively, but without this kind of a violence which numbs, distorts, because more often than not, the violence only engenders eventually a stronger reaction in future, when you are not strong enough to hold it down by force. And this is why the psychicization is a step which is so much emphasized by Sri Aurobindo. He found very often in the, among the early sadhaks, they could be given very great spiritual experiences, their nature opening to higher possibilities, but their lowest parts often were unable to get free. On the other hand, because of these higher developments, there was an exaggeration of the ego or even an exaggeration of the lower desires, taking now guises which were more difficult, more complex, more subtle. And that's when he began to emphasize this first step before moving to the higher step. The higher could be given very quickly, but unless this first step was already established and a sufficient purification through the influence of the psychic in the mind, life and body, the higher would lead to these distortions easily. And so when we begin the journey, if we are able to bring in the influence of this deeper presence within us, none of this ever becomes necessary, none of the hard, violent struggles are necessary. Though they still happen sometimes in the most sticky parts of our nature, in the breaking of the final breaking of the ego, there is always a transition which is a struggle. But the struggle itself is guided by the divine and the inner awakened part in us knows what it is, consents and the passage can be smooth, rapid with the least disturbance or difficulty. And so he says, but in the end, this renunciation or self-denial is always an instrument and the period for its use passes. So we see this as a means to something else, not an end in itself. The rejection of the object ceases to be necessary. So what's the point where you say now all this external forms of renunciation have to fade? The rejection of the object ceases to be necessary when the object can no longer ensnare us. Because what the soul enjoys is no longer the object as an object, but the divine which it expresses. The inhibition of pleasure is no longer needed when the soul no longer seeks pleasure but possesses the delight of the divine in all things equally without the need of a personal or physical possession of the thing itself. Self-denial loses its field when the soul no longer claims anything but obeys consciously the will of the one self in all things. It is then that we are freed from the law and released into the liberty of the spirit. And at that point we can say morality, ethics, laws, rules are all irrelevant. In between, we are passing through a phase where they are all useful, though they may not be as binding or as rigid. As we progress, there is this loosening of the law, greater freedom. Unfortunately, because of the nature of this, because the character of this uh, in the integral yoga, there are many who may prematurely declare, I do not need any rules, I do not need any ethics or morality, I am beyond them because I follow this path. And that's not exactly true, it is a form of self-deception. We have to recognize that all these the training of ethics and morality is essential in the passage before we are able to master sufficiently the animal tendencies in us. And to that extent, self-denial, inhibition and rejection are useful tools in the process of the mastery. But then as in degrees we grow out and enter these three descriptions, where we enjoy no longer the object but the divine which, which it expresses. We seek not pleasure but the delight of the divine in all things. And when 
we no longer claim anything but obey consciously the will of the one self in all beings. As we grow in these three directions, the constructed laws and references automatically dissolve and begin to fade. The perfume of the flower is for me then the divine delight which expresses in form of perfume. The form and beauty of the flower is the divine smiling in the domain of form through this substance. The flower itself is one of an infinity of vehicles through which the divine reveals himself and plays at hide and seek with me. And I am none, I am only his. I am his servant, I am his plaything, his tool in the play, which is his play. So that's the direction in which we tend to move. I had a very beautiful experience which I wanted to share with, uh, because it is still fresh, with uh, meeting a saint just a few weeks ago in uh, Nagpur. I was taken to meet this person. I had no idea, just a few descriptions and I felt something so I said I would like to meet him. And going to him, he was in the Sikh tradition, he lives, he has a Gurdwara, lives in his house behind, very beautiful, uh, opulent house, wealthy obviously. And when we met, he was very humble. And uh, he said, oh, say something. And I said, no, I've come to listen to you. And then he said something very spontaneously, almost in a childlike simplicity. He said, but I am not. And then after a pause, he said, I was once. Till the age of five or six, I was. And then I was not. It was all taken away from me. So I was, I found that very interesting. When he said it, you could feel it. And you could feel in his description as he was describing experiences which he has in the subtle, of subtle things, perceptions, seeing deities and things like that. It was so living, so vivid to him. And he was so full of joy even as he was describing those things. And of things of the world which are all belonging to the divine, expressions of the divine. It was so full of a childlike, spontaneous joy. And then later in the conversation he narrated, I asked a question about that, when he, was, when he was and how he became not. I said, did it happen spontaneously or as a result of some effort? Then he narrated the story and it was fascinating and this is what I wanted to share. He said, his parents had many children, but his father being himself very saintly, was not happy with any of the children because none of them loved God and wanted to live for God alone. So he wanted to have a child who would be like that. And he went and prayed. And I think he was given, I don't know, it's a little faded now, but he was given some instructions for six years, I think, that he was not to touch his wife, but follow a certain prayers and meditations, or maybe one year, I don't remember now. And having done that, then he conceived the child. And then this man, the saint says, I was at that time in the golden temple, in the Akal Takht, which is on one end of the temple. It is a building which was destroyed in 84, rebuilt. But he was of course born before that. And the Kal Takht is one of the sacred buildings. The name is the seat of timeless. That's what the seat mean, the name, name means. So he was seated, he was there waiting. And he received an order from the Lord that he had to take birth in this couple. So he said, all right, because the God, Lord has ordered. So he joined the child and took birth from this uh, couple. But he said, from my childhood, I was always in distress. I was always uh, struggling to see the Lord, to meet the Lord. And I hated everything which was around me because I could not 
experience the Lord. And I was very really deeply unhappy. And I would go into the forest and cry, asking for the Lord to reveal Himself, that, he, that I can be with the Lord always. And then He said, at the age of five, five or six, He received a command. And that was to go back to the Guru Granth Sahib, the sacred book of the Sikhs, open at whatever page it opened, read the one verse on which his hand fell, and put that into practice until it was mastered. And then come back. So he went, opened, oh no, then, and then he had to take the next verse and so on. So he, took, he opened and came on a verse which said, interestingly, be in the world, but remain renounced from within. <laughs> exactly what we have been reading. And so he said it took him intense effort for three months before he was able to live like that, renounced, without owning, possessing anything, although being in the world and dealing with all things as before. And then he said after that, when he had achieved this, then something more happened. In his meditation, the founder of the Sikh tradition appeared before him in a form of resplendent with light. And he said, oh, I have at last, I have the darshan of God. And then the Guru said, do you want to see me in my real form? So he said, yes. He said, I am not in this form. This is the form in which I appear to you so that you can recognize me. And then he said, this is my form. And then he dissolved. And there was a point of light which began to grow in intensity until it was like a thousand suns, as if the whole universe was full of light and thousands of universes of light and so intense. And in that he saw and experienced the Lord, the Divine, as He is. And he said, after that, I was completely immersed, I was dissolved in the Lord, I lost myself completely. And ever since then, he said, I am not. There is only Him. <laughs> very beautiful, very beautiful story, inspiring and deeply moving, which I thought worth sharing here. So, just to read this last portion, we will review this perhaps next time and see how to, we can develop it and put it into practice. But just for now we can read this. The rejection of the object ceases to be necessary when the object can no longer ensnare us because what the soul enjoys is no longer the object as an object but the divine which it expresses. So we enjoy the divine which it expresses. The inhibition of pleasure is no longer needed when the soul no longer seeks pleasure but possesses the delight of the divine in all things equally, without the need of a personal or physical possession of the thing itself. Self-denial loses its field when the soul no longer claims anything, but obeys consciously the will of the one self in all beings. It is then that we are freed from the law and released into the liberty of the spirit. So these are three different experiences which merge into a single experience, but each of these can be uh, developed consciously by certain practices of concentration and in daily life, which we will discuss next time. Maybe now we can just take up some questions or some comments, anything. <laughs> or even pause with this because it's a beautiful experience and a beautiful vision. <laughs> Oh.